wow, gotten a lot done in the last couple weeks. Sorry there hasn't been an update. Been super busy working on this and did some traveling and you know, holidays, season, New Year's, Christmas with families. So haven't really had the time to film anything and update you guys, but I'm just gonna start by talking about the fuselage here and the things that I've gotten done to get it ready for cover. So here we go. Okay, let's talk about the door frame here really quickly. The door frame says in the manual that they can get bent and mine was a little bit bent, but not too bad. It's pretty true to the, true to the shape of the, um, what do you call it, the door jam. We did bend on it a little bit to try and get it to fit. The best way to do that is just slightly pull on it. Usually what's off is this angle it doesn't necessarily match with all the other ones, so it sits a little bit crooked. So we did a little bit of reefing on it and made it straighter, which helps a lot later on to get it to fit nicely. Once we got it lined up, we actually glued wooden spacers to the door, not the necessarily door frame. So the actual door, what well, is the door frame, but it's the the door side of the door frame, not the door jam. The manual says it's glued into the door frame, but I ended up just leaving them on there and it helps when you're pulling it in and out. It just sort of slides right in. To get the right spacing, I ended up using uh, paint sticks with hot glue. Uh, it was Peter's idea and we got it shimmed up nicely so that it's fit just, just right. To line it up, this, the sort of black and white sheet that they give you sort of gets gets the general idea of how to get it done. Project Kit Fox actually has a really good instructional on it. The way he does it is he just sort of holds it up. You have to mark where these tabs line up and you have to cut it short. One thing that Project Kit Fox didn't do that Harlan Payne, Farm Fox, out in I think Southern Illinois, he ended up marking the curvature of the door to help you line it up first. So you can't really see it with your eyes just on its own but you can feel this transition from curved to flat where that's supposed to sit on the door frame. I went ahead and hit that curve with a marker all the way around so that it's so obvious. I mean, it makes it so obvious when you line up the door frame on the top, whether or not you're centered. And at, this, at the same time, you want to also mark this curve right in the door frame, or sorry, in the, in the Lexan and on the door frame. And that helps you line it up between these two points, the front and the back and then also line it up so that you have enough overlap all the way around. I went for the riv nut option. I did use my keyed aluminum riv nuts. This is an aluminum door frame. So ideally you wanna use aluminum rivets so there's no corrosion issues. They're keyed, which I 100% recommend. I've talked about that in another video. The aluminum rivets, sorry, riv nuts are very easy to strip. You can pull the threads out so easily so you have to be delicate with them when you pull them through. But that it's a good method. Again, Project Kit Fox is a good video on that. Once we got it up and lined up, I think I put about, I means about a 16th of an inch all the way around of spacing. You can leave yourself a little bit more room. I think the manual calls for quarter inch overlap for the weather stripping from the Lexan over the door jam. Doors went in pretty, pretty easily. We then ended up mounting the door hinge, sorry, not the door hinge, the uh, door handle. You see this method of holding it in with a pony clamp and the door handle are very effective. One, one other note about this. I drilled these holes one at a time. So the procedure for getting the riv nut stuff in is you drill and set the riv nut holes. You, you put the riv nuts in into the door, um, the actual aluminum frame here. Then you get it up and shimmed in place and then you come through and mark all those holes. And I, I drilled the Lexan holes one at a time. So you drill one, you have to pull it off because you don't want to drill all the way through into the, uh, so, so you just basically tap it. So you put a tiny little twist. We found that that was better than trying to put a marker on it because the marker is sort of blobby and this Lexan cover is hard to see through. So we just took a tiny drill bit, the, or the tip of the smallest uh, Lexan drill bit and drilled a tiny, not a pilot hole, but a sort of marker hole where we wanted to drill the hole. Then we pulled the, the Lexan off, drilled that hole all the way through, and then oversized it to the, to the appropriate size for my screws. Then put it back up, mounted it with that one screw, drilled the second hole independently. And then once I got two screws in and knew that it couldn't wiggle around, then I went through and drilled the rest of them, or marked the rest of them. I didn't wanna go through with a marker and then take it off and drill them all and then find out later that it doesn't fit. It's not a big deal, you can always oversize the holes. But that was the general idea was that 
it helps a lot. And, and that's true with anything. You know, if you can't Clico it in place or drill it in place, then you're gonna have to take it on and off so that you don't have your holes wandering on you because, you know, a 30 seconds of an inch can make a difference in this type of stuff. But yeah, then we mounted the door handle. I have one of, I think it's Brian Bush's custom air conditioning handle that I brought, bought from Brian Bowen from Project at Fox. There's the super fancy air conditioning. This slot here is what closes the door and this slot right here is your air conditioning. So that normally holds you in place. The front of the door is, let me use centimeters because it's easy, 20, three centimeters, well, it's 23 and a half centimeters from the very tip of the door frame there. So this from here to there is 23 and a half centimeters. They say eyeball it, but that that's looked like a really good spacing for me. And we ended up dr drilling these holes in, um, ba you back drill them with the actual aluminum block in and put the, the way that they have these set up is there's a this one I think is called technically a nut cert, but this nut cert, you have to drill the size of the nut cert all the way through the aluminum and it sort of pokes up, not all the way through the aluminum tubing, but it pokes up just on the other side to keep them from rattling. And then you pop them in there. And I, I really like these handles, they're pretty sweet. They could, I mean, Brian Bush, if you're watching, you can drill these out, I think, because this isn't, it's definitely strong enough. You can make this piece lighter by putting holes in there, because it could be a holy piece. Um, it's not, they're, they're super light it is, as is, but there's a little bit of weight. I joke about weight. I can be a weight weenie and try and save ounces and grams here and there, but the cheapest way for me to take weight out of this plane is for me to lose weight, because I could probably cut 30 pounds, and it would be really hard to pull 30 pounds of this plane by just chasing those things like that. So I'm not getting too caught up on the weight stuff. You know, it's my first plane ever building and first plane I've ever owned, so I'm just happy of it gets finished and flies. I'm not super, you know, hell bent on saving every ounce and gram. We ended up mounting the door, with my uncle Peter, we ended up mounting the door hinges. This is a little vague on when to do this. It says wait until the butt rib tab, it says the butt rib is in the final position. So this butt rib isn't fully mounted yet because you have to wait until you finally cover everything and get the spacing right. The only place it can move at this point is inboard and outboard. So it can't go up and down. It's inboard and outboard. I guess you could in theory bend these, but this, the, the up down position is set. These little tabs need to be bent so that they match the bottom of the butt rib tab. And that, as far as I know, is the only thing that really has to be fit before you mount the hinges. Because the only thing that can change about the butt rib is it can't go up and down. It can go in and out. I've already set it up with the wing to be, to be lined up. And there's really not much I can do at this point because it's mounted with rivets, so I can't move it up and down. But we did bend these. These actually took a lot of bending. Some of them were way out of whack. So we bent these into their final position so that they're flush with the bottom. And then we were able to mount the hinges on. Before I move on to the hinges, there's one thing I forgot about cutting the Lexan. It cuts really well with big fiberglass and reinforced cutting discs. And I was originally planning on using a Dremel, but we used just a Dico angle, not Dico angle grinder, it's just a, sort of a pneumatic grinder and that works super well. The bigger the disc, the better, I would imagine. They say for drilling, the slower you can drill, the better. And I would imagine that's because of heat. So onto the door hinges. Not super challenging. There's some gotchas that, that at least got me. Okay, in classic Kit Fox fashion, they don't actually send you a door hinge. They send you door hinge material. And this piece is it's like this big, block that you can cut four of these out of. And I didn't read the instructions well, it's on me, but what I forgot, what I didn't notice was that you're supposed to cut hinge reinforcement material out of the hinge material. So if you, there's like a diagram in the manual that shows you, there's this super confusing diagram from the manual, it shows you there's the, you're supposed to cut the hinge out of those. And then with the excess scrap, which is, this is 6061, it's like, eighth inch 6061. You're supposed to, where the sh on the short end, you're supposed to take strips out of the top and the bottom to make your reinforcing plates out of. I didn't do that. I ended up scrapping all that aluminum, so I gotta order some aluminum strips to make these. Not a big deal, but if I, this is a super confusing diagram. So you cut these out. One side has to be shorter than the other. 
as you can see. I ended up cutting mine down to, let's see, the short end is two and a half centimeters, the long end is, is three and, just say three and, just under three and a half, and so 3.4 centimeters. So you cut these out and then you wanna match them. You wanna mark them <laughs> before you cut them out because they have to be matched together. And this, this, is, this is what mine looks like. So I've got a short end on either side and uh, I don't know, it's just sort of the design that I chose. But you mark them so that they match because if you don't cut them right, then um, you might have some that don't match. I mean, the spacing will be okay, but they won't line up right, they'll, they'll look weird. So you wanna mark them and keep them together forever. The normal rod that's in there, I think it's stainless. It is really tough and hard to cut. So it's best to just pull it out and then cut it to length afterward. I am totally skipping that rod design and we're designing our own removable cotter pin style hinges so the doors will be removable. My, uh, I'm getting these soon in the mail from my uncle. He's custom building me these little safety pin style, safety pin style door hinge. These will be strong enough to hold the door in just in normal flight. It'll have sort of a cotter pin safety feature. And it'll be also easy for me to just sort of pop them out easily, take the whole door off and fly with the doors off, which sounds pretty fun to me. So some other thing about the door hinges, you need a number 12 reamer. Why I didn't have one in the builder's toolkit, that's even more obscure than like the standard reamers, but you need one. So I ordered a number 12 reamer. It's point, you know, it's like 9,000, or not even 9,000, it's like four thousandths of an inch larger than the 3 16th inch reamer. So it makes a difference and none of this hardware will fit without it. And I have this theory that the a and hardware was based on wire gauge size, which is the number versus the size. But no, a and I was corrected on that. a and hardware is in fact based on fractional inch sizing. But I think if I had to go back, I would oversize I, had a, I, went, I went in through calipers on a lot of my AN hardware. It has variability from, you know, it's up to I think six thousandths of an inch, maybe more than that. For example, the 3 16 inch bolts, which is the AN 3 point whatever, they, they are sized from 0.1855 to 0.1890, I believe. So if you get hardware that's too small, you won't even notice it. But hardware that's too big, which I got a lot of, and I've double checked, and that's, I ended up having a huge, hugely difficult time fitting a lot of these, these bolts through because the AN hardware that I got was just slightly big. So if an AN bolt is not fitting, go ahead and throw a set of calipers on it, a really good set of digital calipers and see if it's oversized or not. But mine, my, a lot of mine was. So I ended up having to just wallow the hole out a little bigger when I was reaming, but I should have just, I should have just used the right size reamer, which is an, if I use a number 12, that's the top end of the AN specs. So you can't get anything larger in theory if AN was in, is within spec, you can't get anything larger than a number 12 for 3 16 inch bolts, which is a lot of the hardware in this kit. So you need a number 12 for these because they do not go through well without a number 12. I mean, it's very difficult. Basically, you have to cram it through there. You also need a 100 degree countersink. I've been putting that off, that stupid 100 degree countersink. Didn't buy it a while ago when I needed to do flush mounted rivets. I just figured I'd use a drill bit, but this you can't get around. It's a really nice big hole. Just get a 100 degree countersink. I'm glad I got one. I actually, actually accidentally bought six because it came in a pack from Granger. The hinge just get countersunk to fit these sort of, not pan head, but countersunk head hardware in. What we did was we clamped the door frame in, got it all lined up, lined up one of the hinges and held it in place and then drilled, we back drilled one hole through all the way to the Lexan to mark where that hole was in the Lexan. We then pulled it off of there, drilled the hole through with the Lexan because we want to use the Lexan bit on the Lexan. You're not supposed to use a normal bit. Put it back on, <laughs> then drilled this hole all the way through from the backside with a normal drill bit. So it was a lot of taking off, pulling back on, but we eventually got them in place. And the fact that we didn't have a number 12 reamer made it even more difficult because you really had to cram the bolts in there. With the doors, the 
gas strut, you have to wait until, I think the wing's on, and I'm just gonna wait until finish to put the gas strut, but the hinges are, I believe can be done now. I might find, you know, down the road that I shouldn't have mounted the hinges already, but it just says make sure these tabs are in place, so should be okay. So, for cabling, and I could, could be wrong in this. This is, if you're wondering, oh gee, he does a lot of things like Brian Bowen, that's because I watch that guy's YouTube channel and he's the reason why I do things certain ways. So one of the things Brian did was ran PEX tubing for conduit, which is a great idea. He used fancy ADL clamps to mount his, I just used zip ties. So I bent the PEX so that it fits into the frame. PEX actually bends really nicely. This is, uh, I believe, half inch PEX tubing, and it's plenty to fit, you know, down this one I fit the trim motor power and control, the trim position sensor, the rudder light wiring, and then my DME antenna slash ADSB antenna, which mounts back here. And that runs all the way up to the front. I'll show you where that comes out. Then the other side is a split run. The static port kit runs through most of it. Here's the static port kit. This is not standard. I feel like it's good to have. I'm not putting instrument capability in this immediately, but when I do, eventually, you have to have a static port. So this one would be a real pain to run later on. You know, you'd have to, you'd have to crawl back here and somehow glue it in. Actually, it wouldn't be that bad. But the conduit makes it really easy. And the kit that KitFox sends you for the static port comes with the same color black tubing as the Pedo and AOA. It is industry standard to use different colors for the different plumbing of, uh, for the, basically the air, the Pedo static system. So typically, you know, you use like green for Pedo and then red for AOA and then clear for uh, static port. They didn't come with the kit. That kind of that kind of bothered me because you know I ended up paying for this kit and I get something that I don't really want. So what do I do? Do I just go buy something else? I mean, what was the point of buying in the first place? I ended up buying like refrigerator tubing. This this is the these are like standard water lines that they use for refrigerators. It's, it's the st same stuff that they use for plumbing for static ports and things like that. So I went and bought a thirty foot roll of it and I'm using that for my static port because it's clear. It's a different color as the other ones. But that, this, this kit comes with the black tubing, which I wasn't super stoked about. But, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just rivet this stuff together. And then I ran the plumbing to the back. You're supposed to put a service loop in. You can see this loop that comes around. And that allows a, basically a water trap so that moisture can't get in through the static port. But it comes around through this conduit. And there's a split right here. And I'm gonna run the autopilot wiring for the rear, uh, I guess this is a pitch servo. And then this is my comm antenna, which is also gonna run through that split section of conduit. And that way, I basically have a way of running cabling through here later on without having to crawl back here. You know, in, normally you zip tie all the electronics to the frame. So if you had to do anything to the electronics, sorry, wiring that's back here, you'd have to cut all those zip ties and pull the cabling. But if you wanted to modify any of the wiring now, the, the way that I have it set up, you don't have to cut anything. So you can just access the front end there and get it to run all the way back. And then same thing with the autopilot. You just have to basically take the baggage compartment down and run it through this section. You wouldn't have to somehow take the floorboards out and get underneath here to access the cable wiring that's running down the bottom of the frame, which wouldn't be, wouldn't be too bad, but I just feel like the conduit idea is a really, really good one. Okay, so this is, this is trim position, tail light, trim, and ADS-B antenna. This one runs a home run all the way up the side. Comes underneath the header tank. This comes underneath the header tank, which I actually had to bend that header tank tab a little bit so that it doesn't have a sharp edge rubbing on the conduit and it doesn't end up cutting it in the long run, which would be mucho bad. So it fits really nicely with it bent up just a tiny bit and uh, keeps it so there's like a smooth surface making contact there. And it ends up coming out right underneath this 
I guess it would be over the gear mount plates here, and then it will run. I still haven't decided if I'm going to run it on the outboard side or over on the inboard side where the rudder tape, tape, uh, where the rudder pedals go through. Either way, I wanted it to be down low here because I didn't want it to contact my aileron and I guess aileron and flapperons, Fla aileron and flap function that's here. Because if this sort of breaks, this could come up and hit it. So this actually acts as a security so that it's not gonna pop up and fly and make any interruption to the flight controls. Just something I was thinking about. And on the other side, we have static port, which is a service loop that comes all the way up and around through here, attaches up high, and then it'll be on this Model 7, this one, I think it mounts right about there on the skin. So that comes back up and around, runs through to where the autopilot servo mounts, and there's a split in the tubing. I mounted one into there and one into there. The comm antenna comes down. See, there's comm, which I made. Comm antenna comes down into this one and up to the actual middle. So it goes through that hole right next to the rudder pulleys. It comes out here, and that'll actually run up the middle of the bottom of the seat pan where I think most wiring, wiring typically runs. And I'll be able to, I don't have the, wi the wiring for the autopilot in the back, but when I do, I'll run that, just shiv it, shove it through the tube, and I'll be able to crawl back through here and get it out on this end, and that way we don't have to zip tie anything underneath the baggage compartment. It'd be pretty straightforward. While I'm back here, might as well talk about the autopilot for the pitch servo. It mounts pretty straightforward. This pitch servo comes with an extended crank, crank arm, which you have to put on. They do not include an extra, uh, not safety pin, but cotter pin. So I just safety wired it using, you know, a standard safety wiring method around the castle nut to put this extended arm on. And then it just sort of follows the, you follow the instructions to put this extended tube on and get it in place. I found that the provided Garmin cage, which is supposed to prevent an over center, was too short for what I was doing here. Like the, the throw of the cable was not long enough. Okay, you can't tell because the actual seat pad is in the way. But this, if, if you leave this as the stock distance, you see, you see I ground this out. I think that's 100 degrees between there and there and it's stock. I ended up grinding out a little bit because the crank arm was stopping on this. That was, that was uh, stopping the flight controls. And you do not want this to be your primary flight control stop. So what I did is I, this has already been rigged. So my position of my elevator is correct. And so what I did was I pulled it all the way aft, which I can't do yet because of the seat pad is in the way, and figured out how much space I had here. I ended up grinding a little bit back on each side to make sure that I wasn't hitting the stops. Um, you can see that there's just like a, a hair of clearance there. I wasn't hitting the stops fore and aft on the autopilot cage. I was hitting the stops up in the front for the elevator. Other than that, this is, I mean, about as straightforward of an install as it can be. Just sort of glue it in place. One other note about mounting, mounting this autopilot motor, the metal powder coated piece that they send, the actual sort of mounting plate, mounting cage, is powder coated. And this brass ring is actually on the autopilot. That goes in the inside of the hole that they send you for the plate. You must take the, auto, the powder coat off of the plate or it'll sit too tight on the brass ring and it'll clamp on the autopilot and you'll feel roughness. So I ended up having to just go through and sand all that powder coat off and then maybe even a little bit of metal so that this brass ring sits really comfortably in there and doesn't seize on the crank arm. Because when I first put it in there, I was like, why is there so much resistance? And I realized I didn't take any powder coat off, which is, you know, a theory about powder coat. You gotta make sure that the powder coat is off because they measure, pretty much you can, you can assume that Kit Fox measured it without powder coat. Okay, we're almost done here. This is the front autopilot mount bracket. It's literally just a piece of aluminum angle iron. That's, I think it's two inch um, aluminum angle iron. It's made out of 6061. The measurements in the instructions show a weird measuring point somewhere in here that you have to measure the distance over from. 
And that's actually exactly what I did here. If I had to do it again, I would have spaced it over a little bit more because this is where it mounts on the um, aileron bell crank. It's very close to the arm and it ends up sort of angling this way. When in reality, I'd prefer to have it angled that way. So I would have nudged it over just a smidgen just to give myself a little more room to work with. The provided crank arm, they have the stock arm. This is my Garmin roll servo. Once you get that plate mounted, then you can mount this in the plane. I recommend not using lock washers because you're gonna have to pull it in and out. At least I did a few times. Sorry, not lock washers, but nylock nuts. I just used a nuts to hold it in place. So I mounted it, then I made a mock-up rod that was the right length. So I ended up putting this at full throw to see how long it needed to be on both ends and found that the linear distance, so the, the aileron bell crank basically has a linear distance that it moves forward and backwards. So it's moving like this. And there's a distance that is some line. It's actually a slight arc, but there's in theory a distance that's a, it could be approximated to a line that it has to move fore and aft. And then there's an angular distance that this can provide given the length of the arm. The provided stock plate According to my calculations, I couldn't get it to work to where this wouldn't effectively over center every time. So it ended up having to go beyond 100, I mean, it's not 180 degrees, but it would go to like 100 something degrees. And no matter how I positioned it, it was beyond 100 degrees. The cage that Garvin provides you is 100 degrees. So you want to be close to 100 degrees. It was well beyond that. So what I did is I made, again, my uncle did this, made an extension and we bolted that on here to try and figure out how long of an arm we needed to get the right throw and figured out that the extended crank arm, which is the part that they include with the pitch servo, is long enough to get the right throw. Now, this is just straight from, from the KitFox kit, so I don't know why they didn't provide you with an extra one of these. If, if it, I mean, maybe they, somebody can make it work with just this arm, but the way that I have it set up, there's no way that's gonna go far enough without the potential of an over center, which is scary. So I ordered an extra arm for this, and then I ended up having to order another rod so that this would be the right length. Whew. Okay, two more things left. This, these came in, this is from TKS Racing in California. The same guys who make the Shock Monster system and the, I don't know if they make it, but they sell the Shock Monster system. They also sell uh, aftermarket Kit Fox landing gear. They sell these steps. They're not advertised on their website. It's just sort of a sidestep. You see these a lot on, on Cubs and whatnot. If you do this, it would be hard to, you can't really put your fairings on. I guess you could sort of fit them around the fairings and it would be harder to cover this. You still could cover it. I do not plan on covering this. I'm just gonna leave it exposed. And I like these steps a lot. It makes it so much easier to get in and out of the plane. I, got, I just got the two foot long step and the, I think this is one inch tubing and this is, less than one inch tubing. It's like seven eighths inch tubing, some weird number. So be sure to tell Tony that you want the one for the f factory Kit Fox size if you're gonna get it, but they bolt on pretty easily. My shocks still are leaking. So you can see there's a pool of oil down there. So that's, they need to be taken off and revalved, which TKS is doing at no charge. Okay, last thing here. The rudder pedals, I noticed that these screws were basically coming out too far on the bottom. They were protruding, which is probably not that big of a deal, but I ended up washing them at the top so that they don't stick out at the bottom. Okay, that's not it, but that's it for the fuselage. I'm still trying to determine if I got the right part here for the turtle deck. I got a half inch piece of aluminum angle, which is not what it shows in the manual. So. I don't know how to make it work, but uh, currently they're working on it at the factory and they're gonna let me know what it is exactly that I need or if there's change in the instructions or whatever it is. I asked on the forum and nobody seemed to know. That's, that's it for the pre-cover work on the fuselage. I've gotten a lot of work done on the wings and all the tail surfaces are covered. Still waiting on some finish tapes, which I will get in the next video. In the meantime, thanks for watching and there'll be another video out soon to cover my escapade with the wing covering and tail and rudder surfaces. So talk to you later.